Welcome back to The Der Show. Today there was a congressional hearing at which the presidents of um, major American universities, including Harvard and MIT and the University of Pennsylvania, testified about the incredibly increasing anti-Semitism on campuses. It was a disaster, the testimony. None of them got to the root of the problem. None of them seemed to understand uh, the problem. The president of MIT had no idea what academic freedom uh, was about or the First Amendment. Um, she, she was asked a question and she gave the following incredibly dumb answer. She said, under academic freedom, a professor is entitled to say anything he wants in class. Duh. No, you're not allowed to say anything you want in class. You're allowed to say a lot of things outside of class. But you cannot, in a classroom about mathematics, say that African-American people are racially uh, inferior. Uh, you cannot say in a class uh, in chemistry uh, that communism is better than uh, open market society. You can say all those things outside, maybe. I don't know if you could get away with saying some of that, but you can't say anything you want in the classroom. For example, when I taught for 60 years of a student, um, I was teaching criminal law and a student said, well, raised, raised her hand or his hand and said, um, I really would like to talk a little bit about the New England Patriots and, and why they seem to be losing game after the game. I would say, no, 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 please. You can't talk about that in my class on criminal law, if anybody in the Patriots did anything that was criminal, happy to have you raise it in context, but academic freedom in the classroom, in the classroom is not a license to say anything. Indeed, if you're not a particularly good teacher, you can be, you can be fired. If you're hired to teach math and you go on and start teaching about social science, you can get fired. You don't have a right to do that. In the classroom, you have a job. She had no idea what the meaning of academic freedom uh, is. Um, all the professors, all three of the women, were determined to focus exclusively on, on freedom of speech. Now, I know more about freedom of speech than all three of them combined, and I've devoted my life to uh, freedom of speech, and none of them had testimony that made any sense at all. Uh, the president of, of Harvard, um, uh, President Gay, um, was asked uh, whether Harvard would permit a student or faculty member, I guess, to call for genocide against black people. And there's a simple answer to that. Of course, the answer is no. Uh, nobody who talked about genocide against the black people or, or genocide against gays or genocide against women would be um, tolerated as a teacher or as a student. Uh, students have been thrown out for less. Student, student acceptances have been rescinded because of much, much less than that, not only by Harvard, by NYU. I was involved in, in one such case on behalf of a young man, a client who although himself he was gay, he said something that was construed as negative toward gay or transgender people, I forget. And his acceptance was rescinded. Um, so the issue really was not so much the content of free speech. The issue was the double, the double standard. And, 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 and President Gay of Harvard was then asked a direct question by Congresswoman Stepanek. Um, would Harvard tolerate a student who called for the genocide of the Jewish people? And, and the congresswoman said, you know, I really can answer that question, yes or no. Would you tolerate a student or a professor who called for the genocide of the Jewish people, who said that Hitler was, was right? The only problem is he didn't kill enough Jews. He only killed 6 million. There are still 13 million left. Let's complete the job. Uh, let's have genocide of the Jewish people. Let's have genocide of the black people. No, no university uh, would or should tolerate that, but she couldn't get herself to give a direct answer uh, to that question. Now, 
President Gay has a pretty terrible record when it comes to um, civil liberties and the Constitution. Uh, there was a great professor, still is a great professor at Harvard, named Ronald Sullivan. And Ron and his wife were the first African Americans to be appointed dean of a college. Harvard has a college system where every student after the first year gets assigned to a college, Dunster House or uh, Quincy House. And each college used to have masters, but masters now a dirty word because it suggests master and slave, so they changed the title from master to dean. And and the Sullivans were co-deans of one of the of one of the houses. And then <clears throat> Ron made a terrible, terrible mistake. He did something awful. He actually defended an unpopular person accused of crime. Now he had done that before. He had previously represented. Of uh, the tight end of the New England uh, Patriots, who um, was accused of a double murder, gangland, vicious, premeditated murder, and he, Ron defended him. <clears throat> Not a single student complained about that. Nobody said they felt unsafe. But when Ron, for one month, allowed his brilliant legal talents to be used to consult, essentially, with Harvey Weinstein, Harvey Weinstein, who was accused of not rape, essentially, but having, you know, the casting couch, uh, <clears throat> he um, got fired. He got fired. And who do you think was the person who ultimately fired him? It was then Dean Gray, who became the president. Part of the reason she was thought to be a good president is she was willing to fire uh, a professor from the deanship based on his Sixth Amendment. Remember, Harvey Weinstein had a Sixth Amendment right to be represented, and he chose to be represented for one month by Ron Sullivan. But that was enough for the dean of the college, Gay, to essentially fire him. Now, she says, I didn't fire him. I just didn't rehire him. Well, deans of colleges get rehired. And if you're not rehired, <clears throat> you're fired. And that's what happened. And there's no mistaking that. And she was asked about that. And of course, she ducked the question. Uh, basically, I can't talk about personal matters. Um, um, if she had a better answer, perhaps she would have talked about personnel matters. Um, but right now, the people who are in charge of our major institutions, our major institutions of, Harvard, of higher learning, do not seem to be the best equipped to deal with the current problem of anti-Semitism on campus. They don't have the self-confidence. They don't really understand the First Amendment. They don't understand freedom of speech. They don't understand academic freedom. And so they use cliches when asked hard questions. Um, Nobody really got to the nub of the problem, and you know what I think the nub of the problem is. The nub of the problem is represented by some of these presidents of, of universities. It's it's the bureaucracy that has now been built around the diversity, uh, equity, inclusion um, uh, uh, mantra, um, and 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 diversity, equity, inclusion is an evil evil thing, not in concept. We all want diversity, except diversity, except the DEI bureaucracy. They don't want diversity. They want uniformity of opinion. They just want diversity of skin color. So no, they don't want diversity. A university should want diversity of opinions. It should be out there encouraging fundamentalist Christians to come and challenge um, atheists and, and agnostics. Um, they should be encouraging people who really believe the Second Amendment is designed to make sure that tyranny can be responded to by weapons. I don't believe that, but people do. That's the kind of diversity university should be looking for. Not skin deep diversity alone, but that's what they're looking for. All universities today and all the DEI bureaucracy is looking for is counting the number of African-Americans, counting the number of Latinos. By the way, 
you don't count all Latinos. You don't count them if they come from Cuba. Um, you only count them if they come from Mexico and Puerto Rico and some other places. So even within the concept of Latino or Hispanic, uh, there are, are, are differences. And you certainly don't count Jews, even if they're Hispanic or Latino in background or Sephardic um, and uh, come from poor backgrounds and indeed even have dark skin. If they're Jewish, they don't count. And if they're Asian, they don't count. But what about equity? Who can oppose equity? I can't, because equity is exactly the opposite of equality. Equality is Martin Luther King. I dream of a day when my children will be judged, not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Equity says, no, do not, do not ever judge somebody by the content of their character, by their intelligence by their hard work, by their meritocracy. No, don't do that. That's the opposite of equity. You have to only consider identity politics. What race are they? What gender are they? What sexual preference are they? And then there's inclusion. Uh, the third I, uh, part of the DEI. But as former President Summers of Harvard said, and he's completely right, most of the inclusion criteria, some of them in writing, exclude Jews and exclude Asians. So when inclusion is used to exclude, when equity is used to deny equality, and when diversity is used to deny intellectual diversity or other kinds of diversity, this entire bureaucracy should be dismantled. But what wasn't mentioned in today's hearings is that the DEI bureaucracy is the place from which much of the anti-Semitism derives. It is an incubator for hate because it's a zero-sum game. Anything that benefits one group has to disadvantage another group. And so it's no surprise that the DEI bureaucracy has been a central focus and locus of anti-Semitism. The same thing is true of these departments that universities have decided to establish over the last 20, 30 years. There's a separate department now for black studies. You don't include black studies as part of American history. It's black studies, women's studies, gay studies. Asian studies, South Asian studies, North Asian studies, um, transgender uh, studies, Jewish studies. I don't approve of any of them uh, because they've all been the source of we, they attitudes. And if you're in one of these departments, you're much more likely to express anti-Semitic views. And somebody ought to do a study of that. You know, when George Floyd uh, was murdered by Chauvin, the policeman, it was a terrible thing. Um, he became, obviously, the symbol and the reckoning. He was a, not a good symbol because he himself, we don't know exactly the circumstances of his death. We know he was um, uh, filled with drugs. and um, But Chauvin, what he did was horrible and, and beyond horrible. But uh, for one man, one man uh, being killed, there was an entire reckoning. And that's how essentially the DEI program prospered. Um, we always had um, critical race studies, which were not critical. They were just uh, cheering squads for one particular race. Um, but, but we always had some of that. But it got a boost, a tremendous boost, from the reckoning resulting from the killing of George Floyd. Don't you think it's time for a reckoning about anti-Semitism? Look what's going on on campuses. Students are shouting, gas the Jews. Students are shouting, Hitler didn't kill enough. Students are shouting, clean, clean the Middle East. Clean them of what? Clean them of Jews. Palestine will be free. Of what? Of Jews. From the river to the sea. Uh, even President Gay recognizes that that's an anti-Semitic slogan. Of course, it's an anti-Semitic slogan. That's that's permitted um, uh, yeah, under circumstances where anti-black slogans probably would not be permitted. There'd be a different, there'd be a different response. 
But we know that uh, the DEI bureaucracy has contributed enormously. And this has to be a reckoning now and, and, and a, a data-driven reckoning. Let's look at the relationship between the bureaucracy, the DEI bureaucracy and anti-Semitism. Let's see how many of the anti-Semitic protests and letters and activities emanate from it. Let's see how the increase of anti-Semitism can be somehow correlated with the increased influence of DEI. Let's see what impact these identity politics department have on anti-Semitism. Don't take my word for it. Do research, objective research. Don't appoint people that have a job. Uh, and by the way, there are people, there are, there are thousands of people today who are employed by these bureaucracies who wouldn't get a job otherwise. Um, and, 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 and it's essential that we do research and see what the causes of the new anti-Semitism are. And, and you know what you're going to hear from them. It's not anti-Semitism. It's anti-Zionism. Yes, we're picking on the only country in the world that is the nation state of the Jewish people. We're not going after the 40 or so Muslim states, but it's not anti-Semitism. It's anti-Zionism because Israel is a settler, colonialist uh, country. Colonialist. Oh, my God. Talk about colonialism. Talk about New Zealand. Uh, you want to go back a little further in time? Talk about the United States and Canada and Australia. These are all areas that were settled by colonialists. Israel was the exact opposite. Israel were individual people who had been discriminated against and subject to pogroms in their home countries. And they came seeking freedom and an ability to live a decent life. And they improved the life of the local population. Of course, Jews were part of the local population. Jews had lived in, in, in uh, what the Romans called Palestine since before the birth of Jesus, a thousand years before the birth of Jesus. They are native uh, to, to, to the land. And uh, the idea that they somehow are colonialists is absurd. But ask a 22-year-old or a 19-year-old Harvard student what country is a colonialist settle a country. The only one they'll name is Israel, because that's been part of the propaganda and the propaganda has caught on and 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 become uh, the accepted truth on on major universities today so these hearings did no good at all except to send a message to some of these presidents congress is looking over your shoulder not only a donor is looking over your shoulder and we are uh, not only are people who might want to get a job teaching i have to tell you today if I were in the market, when I was in the market for a law school job, I got offered a job at every major law school in the United States. I got offered a job at Harvard, Yale, Columbia, NYU, Stanford, uh, Penn, everywhere. I could have picked any place I wanted. I don't know if I would pick Harvard today. I just don't know if I would pick Harvard today. Of course, the choices aren't great. Um, but, you know, maybe I'd pick University of of Chicago, which has accepted the Chicago principles. And the Chicago principles are a university is a forum for political debate. It's not part of the political debate. And so Harvard should not have taken a position on the killing of George Floyd. It should not have taken a position on uh, the Ukraine war, and it should not take a position on Israel. But if it did take a position on George Floyd, then of course it has to condemn Hamas, because what Hamas did was infinitely worse than what Chauvin did to, um, to George Floyd. There's no comparison, not at all. Uh, and you can't do one without the other. You can't say, oh, we don't take positions on controversial issues. Yes, you do. Yes, you did. And yes, you will continue to. You just don't take positions on issues involving Jews or take feminist departments. There are departments at universities today that are women's departments, and they've taken positions on Israel and on the conflict. How many of them condemned the rapes, the mutilations, the sexual assaults of women? What happened to the Me Too movement? It's not Me Too. It's you, too. 
but not me, not if I'm Jewish, not if I'm a woman who lives in, in Israel. Me too doesn't seem to apply. Believe women, except if they're Jewish and live in Israel. Then we have a different rule. Then believe Palestinians. Uh, men, believe Hamas, but don't believe Jewish uh, women. Uh, where are the feminists and the women? Where are uh, gays? I'll tell you where they are. Gays for Gaza, feminists for Hamas, progressives for Hamas. Hamas murders gays, allows women to be subject to honor killings, but it doesn't matter. They're against the Jews. If they're against the Jews, must be something good about them. Uh, the other slogan, which the useful idiots, you know, your children, your friends' children, uh, follow is if it's left, it's right. If it's left, you got to follow it, no matter what it is, how stupid it could be, as long as it, the left is saying it, you got to follow it. And that's just, just, just absurd. So I don't think today's hearings did very much good, except to put the fear of God into some of these universities. And now some teeth have to be put into what Congress is talking about. It was a vote today about uh, essentially uh, condemning, you know, anti-Semitism. And it, 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 some Democrats voted against it. Some stayed home. Um, there's a real problem in the Democratic Party today, a problem that may cause a lot of people, including me, to reconsider whatever allegiances we ever had. I never had an allegiance to the Democratic Party. I just voted mostly for Democrats. But I have to tell you, anybody who voted against a resolution condemning anti-Semitism, condemning Hamas, condemning any of that, anybody who did that, I will help support any candidate who runs against them, either in a primary or in the general election. Yes, I will support Republicans who vote against, who run against the squad, and who run against um, Democrats who can't bring themselves to condemn anti-Semitism or Hamas. Yes, and that means the House may go to the Republicans, the Senate may go to the Republicans, so be it. So be it. This is more important. And so you have my word. If you are running against any of these cowards or any of these bigots, count on my support. I'll fly out to your district. I'll campaign for you. I'll raise money for you. I'll write up beds for you. I'll talk about you on my podcast. Just tell me who you are and who you're running against. And it's not that I'm on your side. It's that I'm against them. I don't know if I'm on your side or not. I don't know you. It may depend on what your views are. But you have a commitment from me, no matter what your views are. If you're running against any of those people, you can count on, on my support. Because we have to stand up to this kind of, of bigotry whether it comes from the left or the right, where Republicans or Democrats, and today it comes primarily from the left and from Democrats. So, yeah, my allegiance, so to speak, to the Democratic Party is very much being tested. I really feel like uh, a homeless political person. I don't have a home in the Democratic Party. <coughs> Excuse me. And I certainly don't have a home in the Republican Party on issues like... Excuse me. <laughs> issues like gay rights and women's rights and abortion. So I'm homeless and I'm independent. I've always been independent. So be it. All right, let's take some uh, questions. There was, a, there was a, a, a personal question on the live stream. Somebody had just seen Picket Fences and in it, Fiva Schwinkel um, was portrayed as a Jewish lawyer who had to argue a case in the Supreme Court. And, um, uh, the question was, was that lawyer modeled after me? No, he wasn't modeled after me. But I actually consulted with Fivish Finkel. And we had a meal together. And I told him, with the help of my son, Elon, what arguments uh, he should make to the Supreme Court that would both be appealing to a television audience and appealing to the justices. And he did it. I think I remember that he won his case. Um I should stop watching your videos concerning Israel by now as you exactly express opinions held by me and I'm quite knowledgeable on the subject, being an IDF veteran living now in North America. I would like you to voice an opinion regarding Netanyahu and the need for him to resign immediately or be pushed out knowing that personally you're his friend. Would you have the courage to do that? Of course I'd have the courage to do it if I thought it was right. I don't think you change leaders 
in the middle of a war. There was an effort to change leadership of Franklin Delano Roosevelt after um, Pearl Harbor. Uh, there was an effort to change the leadership of Abraham Lincoln after some of the terrible defeats that the North uh, suffered at the hands of the Confederacy. But uh, no, you don't change leaders. Uh, get back to me when the war is over. We'll talk about it. I do think that uh, Netanyahu has some explaining to do, and I think that will happen. There will be a commission of inquiry, and um, the, the Israeli people will decide how to deal with him, and, uh, but not in the middle of a war. And the Israeli people don't want to see him change in the middle of the war. If there is, there's a mechanism for doing it. You know, you don't have to impeach a prime minister. All you have to do is have one vote lost in the Knesset. And I think uh, people are not ready to do that at this point. These are the same Palestinians who were dancing and celebrating in the streets of Gaza after the attacks on 9-11. So no sympathy for me. I have sympathy for the very young children. I have sympathy for the people who were oppressed by Hamas. I do not have sympathy for the people who cheered on uh, either 9-11 or the uh, rapes and murders that occurred on the 7th. And that would be a majority of the people of Gaza. So no, I, I don't have sympathy. I still think Israel has to comply with all the rules of law, even if they're not sympathetic. And, um, you know, it's interesting because uh, Israel is, has done a, a good job. There have been no reports of rapes uh, by Israeli soldiers uh, in retaliation for, for the rapes done to their friends. Um, no, Israel is fighting a clean and legitimate war, much the way the United States did after 9-11. Yes, the women had their pelvis broken. They endured things that should never have happened. The silence is deafening. It's because it's not happened to them yet. And I don't want to talk about the silence. The silence is deafening. Where are the UN women? I want to talk about the National Lawyers Guild, which is lots and lots of women in the National Lawyers Guild. They claim to be a feminist organization. They're, they they ban. They, they, they uh, didn't allow their own lawyers to defend anybody charged with rape. That's how sensitive they are to rape, except when it comes to Jewish or Israeli women. The National Lawyers Guild defended, pl applauded what Hamas did on October 7th. Shame on the National Lawyers Guild. Anybody who still belongs to that organization has to look themselves in, in the mirror. Um, it, it's a disgraceful, disgraceful organization of despicable lawyers who stand behind uh, rapes, murders, beheadings, just because it's done by people they believe are on the left. That people are not on the left. These people hate women. These people hate gays. But if they're against Israel, against the United States, hey, you can count on the National Lawyers Guild to be on their side. <clears throat> I was passively antagonistic toward Israel uh, until I heard the news of October 7th. Uh, the pure evil of that day changed my perspective forever. I'm so glad you share your views here to shine some light on these dark days. My question is, why were you against Israel uh, before October 7th? But obviously October 7th did change the mind of some people. Not enough people. Not the 33 groups of Harvard students that said that the entire blame for October 7th was on Israel you blame the victim. You blame the people who were raped. You blame the people who were beheaded. You blame the nation that they represent. Dersh, you say the IDF is not killing civilians, yet I see footage of bloody children and women pulled out of the rubble. I never said these. the IDF is not killing civilians. I said they are not targeting civilians. The last thing they want to do is kill any civilians. But when civilians hide, uh, become human shields, and when Terrorists hide among civilians. Civilians will die. According to a French newspaper assessment, they claim that for every terrorist killed, two civilians are killed. I don't know whether that's true or not, because Hamas doesn't even reveal figures about who's a terrorist and who's a civilian. But if that ratio is true, if two civilians are killed for every terrorist, for every combatant, that is the best ratio ever achieved by any country facing a similar conflict, far better than the ratio achieved by the United States, far better than the ratios achieved by Great Britain and France and, and others in incomparable situations. So if the ratio is, is two to one, I'd still like to see it lower. 
Um, but even if it's three to one, it would be much lower than any country in, in, in modern history. And an expert the other day at, from the Pentagon said that, uh, in his view, Israel does more to protect civilians and has a better ratio than any country facing comparable threats. And when the best is called the worst by the world, you know there's something wrong with the world. Uh, see you tomorrow.